So welcome everyone to this Intralingo Spotlight. I'm Lisa Carter, founder and creative director of Intralingo. Today, uh, we are speaking to Sue Burke, who is uh, a former journalist, a writer, an author, uh, a translator as well. Um, and welcome, Sue. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so good to have you here. So, um, Sue, you, as I said, as I just said, you've written all kinds of things. Um, but in 2018, your debut novel came out, that's Semiosis, and it was followed this year by the sequel, Interference. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, you the novels have um, been shortlisted for prizes, finalists on best of lists. It's it's wonderful. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was, was I'm really pleased. Yeah, absolutely. It's so great. So I'd love, Sue, for you to tell us just, first of all, a little bit about your trajectory leading up to uh, to writing these novels, and then, then we'll get into um, the actual content of the novels and the ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the truth is I always wanted to be a writer. Even before I knew how to read, my mother would read me books. I knew someone wrote those books, and I could do that too. I was sure when I learned how to read, uh, when I learned how to write. So a bunch of stuff happened. I became a journalist, which is really fun work, mm -hmm. um, and worked as a newspaper and magazine writer and editor for a long time. Um, and then my husband and I moved to Spain. Um, right. We always wanted to live in a foreign country. We knew Spanish. It would be a chance to, to perfect our language. So we moved over there. Um, by then I had already been writing science fiction, um, some short stories, um, doing some other work, uh, starting a couple of novels and never quite finishing them. Um, so we were over there. I continued to write, um, journalism has been changing over the years. Um, so I switched more and more to, to doing fiction. There is where I started writing the novel. Although the inspiration actually came when I was still living in, in Milwaukee in the United States. I had a lot of houseplants and one of my houseplants actually wrapped itself around another houseplant and killed it. Right. And at first I thought, as I should have been paying more attention. And then within a month, another plant attacked another plant and I thought that was pretty weird. So I did some research and discovered that, that plants are actually very aggressive and they will fight to the death for sunlight. There is never enough sunlight. Um, and learn more and more about them. And as I began to understand what they could do, I began to think, well, what if they could think like us? If they, they can do all of these other things, if they could just plan ahead a little bit more consciously, what would happen? And science fiction gave me the skill, the, the, the tools to explore that question. And put, them, put another planet, put some humans there, put some plants there who know how to think and then see what happens. Naturally, there's gonna be conflict because as I say, plants are aggressive, they're nasty. Not always, they can be very reasonable too. <laughs> and then things happen. Yeah, oh, that's so great. I absolutely love that it started with a house plant. Mm -hmm. I yeah. still have them as you see, but I watch them very carefully. Very now. carefully, <laughs> especially after your research and knowing what they're capable of. <laughs> Oh, that's so great. Um, so yeah, so semiosis and interference take place on, on another planet, on PAX. It's what's called a first contact novel. So the mm -hmm. first humans that arrive and, and discovering all about the, the plants. Um, I think you're going to read a section for us. Is that right? Yeah. What I have, it's the start of um, chapter six from Interference. Mm -hmm. And it's a discussion between two trees. One is the protagonist. And then um, one of the other trees around there that he more or less gets along with, as you'll see. So, shall I start? Sure. A spark of ethylene freezes a few of my rootlets as the auxins are inhibited. The main locust wood speaker wants my attention and strikes where a patch of our roots overlap. It is odd that he should greet me in an almost non-destructive fashion. 
He is the new speaker for his grove of trees, but already behaves typically for his species with aggression. The biggest and most belligerent tree in the local grove becomes not merely the spokesman, but the only breeding male. So the entire species aims for size and hostility. No doubt he wishes to speak about my service animals. The recent arrivals from Earth have created a noticeable change to understate the situation absurdly. We have a question, he says. No demands? No bluster? He must be distressed. Yes, I answer. A migratory group has arrived for a visit. We do not understand. The service animals. No doubt you have observed a change, but it is temporary. We are concerned about the fires. The fire tonight is for a celebration and will be strictly controlled, as it is every year. He ought to remember that. These fires have already occurred. They were along the border with the Coral Plains. Fires at the Plains? I know nothing about that, but I keep my response calm, if only because an excited locust wood is a dangerous locust wood, and they get excited easily. Well, tell me more. Our southern groves saw small fires the past two nights. They started in the coral plains and did not spread to our forest, but five fires are too many. Our other groves can show you where. Your service animals must investigate. Oh, they will do so, and thank you for the notice. Five. Fire is our greatest danger, although locust woods tend to overreact. Swamp fires are not forest fires. Methane is the likely cause since it can ignite spontaneously and at low temperature and thus harmlessly. But if that is what is if that is what has happened, and yet such fires are uncommon. Five may be far too many. But about your animals. We have heard of odd movements and some strange members. They can fly, for example, and they are not bats or cactuses. Oh, the visitors will eventually fly away and the city will remain the same. And we wish to have the trunk of the previous speaker harvested. I did not expect that. When the old speaker died, his day, death hastened by his rival's quest to achieve speakerhood, we had agreed to leave the dead tree stand in honor of his service. Uh, why do you wish it removed? It lies in the way of new growth. Have your animals cut it down promptly. They will appreciate the wood. Perhaps for the speaker, it is a reminder of his dishonorable deeds to displace the incumbent. Or the dead tree may genuinely be in the way of new growth new female tree, trees for the speaker to add to his grove. Uh, but in any case, the wood has a remarkable pattern called checkerboard by the humans and plaid by the glass makers. So it can be used for items of beautiful utility and decoration. So this is good news for the city. I must not sound too agreeable, however, or the locust wood might interpret that as weakness. I shall order it done. And we must set the quota for this year's harvest. Perhaps, given your success, it can be expanded. Your wood is very useful. Provided it is only used for durable purposes, we do not wish to be burned any more than you do. Oh, we will discuss this further. In the summer, meanwhile, keep the fires tonight under control. Oh, we have sufficient experience and keep your animals under control. Of course I will. I also have long experience with this species. My deepest roots remind me that I have not always had successful experience with these species, both with individuals and with groups. Now, while I have extended my understanding in many ways over the years, this wisdom does not always serve in new situations, and every day is a new day with new problems. That is so fantastic. 
Yes. So the voices there, of course, were Steve Lind, who is a plant, a bamboo plant, and the locust wood. And you know what fascinates me so much about what you've been able to do here, Sue, is, is take your knowledge of communication, of language, the way that it works, and transfer that, well, to what we would consider an inanimate species, number one, to plants, mm -hmm. um, but also an alien and foreign species. And I know you've mentioned this to me as well, how, how difficult that was to put yourself as a writer to um, portray or from the point of view of, of an alien. Can you tell us a little more about that? Uh, yeah, my, my frustration was that as someone who, as a translator, mm -hmm. um, I know another language, I'm learning a third language, in fact, and I know how different languages are. So I know if these two were actually talking to each other, it would be incomprehensible to human beings. So I had to think of a way of them. And there's some other species in, in the book and they have to communicate with each other too in one way or another. And how could I make it understandable to the reader um, and still try to make it a little bit foreign, a little bit alien? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really satisfied with what I did. Oh, I did the best I could. Um, I mean, it's like a, a translation. I'm never really satisfied with what I translate. <laughs> I get it close, but there's always a little bit of something that's different. Yeah. Um, so I had to work with that. One of the things, though, that, that, that I know, being fluent in another language, is that when I'm talking in the other language, I'm just talking about meaning. And even if the words are different, even if the, the sentence structure is totally different, what I'm trying to say is the same thing. So there's a justification to make it sound like human speech, because to them, it would be sounding like, look, there would be no difference between how we sound to ourselves and how they sound to ourselves. On the other hand, how does it sound to us? Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, as you say, it, it has to be readable for us because what we are concerned about is not the language, but the meaning, the story that you're right. telling. So for us as readers, it's a, it's a different experience yet again. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And the other um, you mentioned, so the other species, the glassmakers, they definitely have a different form of speech, um, which is recognizable on the page. And, and when you when you read it. Um, and do you want to tell me a little bit about how you decided to construct that? What what the different element was that would distinguish them? Um, it's based on, on um, two things we have here on Earth, on ants who communicate with scents, um, different smells. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been broken down um, as to what each smell means and why. Um, and birds, who of course use bird songs. And people who are bird watchers can listen to a bird and tell you that that bird is angry, that bird is warning you, that bird is, is just talking to other birds and saying, hi, I'm here, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so birds have a language, too, that, that we can somewhat understand. Um, so I tried to combine them. And um, in a way, some of it we're going to understand as human beings. We can listen to a whistly sort of a language. And, and once we understand it, the way that we can listen to Japanese, mm -hmm. if we know the language, we know what those sounds mean. Um, but we're not good at sense, so there would always be something we wouldn't be understanding about them. Their grammar, too, is just going to be different because grammar is always different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought the, the scent language was so inventive. Um, and it's, just, uh, it's, it's what ants do, exactly yeah. what ants do. It is, but but how you assigned, um, you know, a recognizable sense for us, you know, I, I think it was, I can't remember actually if it's mm -hmm. strawberries make mean happiness or something like that, but that, that pairing was was wonderful. Yeah, the other part I've found, of course, and it's all interrelated because language is culture and, you know, culture is uh, or expressed one way through language. And this is a first contact 
um, uh, story. Um, but there's so much more too there in terms of culture. It's, it's trying to understand the new culture, uh, obviously communicate with it. But what I found particularly interesting in interference um, is also this notion of perspective and how what we see we interpret in a certain way based on our own um, worldview. Um, yeah, I'd just love for you to, to tell us a bit more about this notion of culture and what you were attempting to do here as well. Yeah, um, what I wanted to show, and, and this won't be news to people who perhaps have traveled or, or lived in another culture, is that um, what you notice isn't what other people notice and what they do, even if it looks familiar to you, they may be doing for an entirely different purpose. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to show is that, so you had some humans who came to earth, there was a, an established human colony there, but it was new to them. Um, there's a whole bunch in their nature the, the, the plants and animals on that planet that the people who live there understand perfectly well. Um, but to the newcomers, they don't know what's dangerous. They don't know what's not. Um, they don't know what's normal and what's not. Um, and so they had a period of intense learning. Um, and I wanted to show that and to show um, also, both sides lie to each other a lot. Mm. They don't want each other to know what they're actually doing, and for good reason. Um, and how they would go about that, what that would look like to each other. Um, there's also a chapter from the point of view of one of the glassmakers who are totally alien to us. And this particular one's her problem is not a problem that might be familiar to us. And her solution is, is, again, something that wouldn't necessarily occur to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think also just the way you've structured the novel, as you said, each chapter is from a different point of view. So we really mm -hmm. get a, a very... Um, a very broad and encompassing view of, of this world from all these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun too. Yeah, yeah, it must have been. <laughs> changing, changing voice every chapter. That's fantastic. That's great. Well, I would um, love to know, just to wrap up here, Sue, what you hope readers will take away from, from your duology. Um, what I was... What I hope is that they're afraid of their own gardens now. Um, <laughs> or more seriously, that they understand that what the plants are doing on that other planet are things that they can do here. And they do do here. Yeah. Um, they have difficult lives. They have to fight for survival. They have a lot of skills, but a lot of enemies and a lot of problems too. And I hope that they understand that the, that the plants that are around them um, have their own issues and that they deserve a lot of attention and a lot of respect. There's something called plant blindness hmm. where you like, you see a tree and that just every other tree is the same tree. Well, no, it's not. Um, so that they begin to see the individuals that are around them and understand that, that their lives are, are um, difficult for them, but important for them too, because this is our environment. If all the plants died, we're dead too. Yeah. And as a translator, I want to say, this has been, my book has been translated semiosis. I have Japanese. Oh, fantastic. I know you, you have it in French as well. Is that and right? I have French. That's fantastic. I love the artwork on that. I even um, was contacted by the French translator who had a couple of questions that I could understand because she needed to know, for example, are all of these, these people that you named, are they all female or male? Because she can't tell, but French, is, you have to say that. Yes. Um, so I understood that question. There's a bird called a boxer, and she wanted to know why is that boxer? Because it could be a box, like he lives in a box. Mm -hmm. could be a box. He's a fighter. So I'd explain. Yes, this is a box who who fights. So that's why he's called that. Oh, that must have been so fun for you to receive those questions and see your your book in a new light through that mm -hmm. that other language lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And what's next for you, Sue? 
<laughs> I'm working on another novel, totally unrelated to this, and I'm mm -hmm. now on the seventh rewrite. Okay. As a translator, I, I, I believe it's much easier to translate a book than to write a novel. Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. Um, and then just continuing to write all the time. I've been contacted with a, I, I used to live in Spain, I'm now in Chicago, mm -hmm. and been contacted by some people in, in Spain who are having a project to translate some short stories into English, and I'll be working with that as well. So Excellent. I'll still be translating. Fantastic. Translating is fun. It is. It is great work. Oh, I love it so much. Well, I really, really enjoyed reading both Stemiosis and Interference. Um, it was fascinating to me to, to see this notion of communication and language and culture and knowing that you're a translator and how you infused the book with that really made it rich for me, absolutely, as a reader. Mm -hmm. So thank you for it. Um, I will be sure to include absolutely your bio will be in the show notes below this video as well as links so uh, readers can find you online. Uh, and of course, a link um, to where your books uh, can be found so that uh, everyone watching and listening can can get a copy and read it. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's been really great to talk to you. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this spotlight video, I would encourage you to please subscribe to the Intralingo channel, uh, to like this video, to comment on it, to share it. And uh, let's continue to explore uh, the world through books. Thanks very much, Sue. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.